the ultimate outcome of this crisis, um, our ability to not just survive, but to thrive as an organization and to prosper in the times after the crisis is really going to be impacted by our ability to maintain the morale of our teams. And I'll tell you, I still remember my very first job. Um, it was uh, one of the first jobs I ever had. Um, and at the time I was working in Bulgaria, um, which had incredibly high unemployment. Um, we were paid next to nothing. I was working in an office that literally had one computer. So we had to take turns at the computer working. Um, we were paid very little. But that said, I remember those as some of the best days of my life. Um, we had an incredible amount of camaraderie amongst each other. Uh, I felt like I was amongst friends all the time. We spent a lot of good time chit-chatting with each other. We supported each other at work all the time. And even at times I had to work the night shift, uh, my colleagues would stop by the office just to keep me company during the night shift instead of going to party on the beach, which is what we did growing up in a sea resort. Um, so it was a very difficult time, but I remember it fondly. Unlike another job that I had, um, and I'm just going to skip the name of that organization, where all of us were very highly paid. We were paid in the six figures and more. Uh, all of us were working in beautiful offices overlooking the Puget Sound, beautiful views. Uh, all of us had wonderful computers, and, and everything seemed to be fine, except for everyone was unhappy. We were constantly fighting with each other. We were constantly complaining about compensation. Something was always wrong. Uh, the, these were some of the best times in the industry, but somehow, in the, even in the best of times, we were always falling apart. We were unable to execute basic projects. And frankly, I remember those as some of the most frustrating times in my life. So here is one place in a time of crisis that I remember fondly and I remember as having had a really good time. And another that was in times of prosperity and success, um, which unfortunately was also an organization I, um, I try not to remember as much. And needless to say, one place still exists and the other one for all intents and purposes it doesn't anymore. Morale is kind of an elusive category. Um, it's something that's much like the air in the office. It's always there, it exists. And you only notice it when it goes bad. And you only notice it when, when it is something that, uh, that goes wrong. And there are many definitions of morale and we'll go through all of those definitions. Uh, but the, the best one that I could find, the, the one that really resonates with me is that morale is the spirit of a group that makes its members want the group to succeed. Really the dedication that we have to each other and our desire to see the group, the team succeed is what morale is made of. Um, the founder of Southwest Airlines, which is consistently ranked as the best airlines by passengers, says that there's only one key to profitability and stability in times both of boom and bust, and that really is employee morale. And I very much believe that, which is the topic of this presentation because as we've said many, many times, as an industry, we're incredibly good at reaching out to our clients. We're incredibly good at waking up in the middle of the night, thinking about our clients and what they need. We're very good at writing letters to all of our clients and sending those out, explaining what the crisis means to them, what the markets are doing, what this is happening to their financial plans. But unfortunately, very often we forget to talk about each other. We forget to talk to each other. We forget to take care of each other. And actually, we did a survey of you, a survey of the G2 members, and we found that virtually every single organization on this call has written multiple emails and has made many, many conference calls to, to your clients. I think the average number of emails sent to clients was three, and that was about a month ago in the middle of March. Um, however, at the same time, I have yet to talk to a CEO who has actually written a letter to their employees. And I know this is not a, it's not an industry of memos and letters to employees and big speeches, but that said, it is a time when we together have to reach out to our teams, to our respective teams, the teams that we lead, and just really make sure that we maintain and we actively manage their morale. As we said, the best definition of morale is really the desire that the spirit that group members have um, and their desire to see the group succeed. But morale has a lot to do also with other synonyms, kind of words that we frequently use. Things like team satisfaction, the well-being of a team, um, teams like team engagement, things like um, um, commitment, teams like involvement, teams like passion, teams like terms like empowerment, like enthusiasm of a team. All of those are components of team morale and all of those are characteristics of team morale. And of course, many ways to look at that, but almost by definition, morale is something that emerges or takes, takes center stage in times of crisis, in times when we're challenged. 
So the ability to persevere, the ability to be creative, all of these characteristics of teams that succeed are very much an integral part of morale as well. Now, morale kind of goes together with other terms such as culture, such as motivation. Um, and, and I want to kind of explain a little bit that interaction as well. First of all, the morale can be something that's implied to a person and it's something that can be applied to a group, to a team. Um, today, we want to, want to focus on the morale of a team, the way in which a team interacts, the way in which a team comes together, and less so on individual motivation. We've spent a lot of time on individual motivation in the G2 classes, and you've heard me talk a variety of presentations about that. Notice, by the way, that there's a difference between individual motivation and team morale. As a matter of fact, it's not unlikely that you will encounter someone who is individually very motivated, someone who really has the drive to succeed. Unfortunately, that same person may be a detractor from team morale. They may be very harmful to team morale. As a matter of fact, overly ambitious people that were really motivated to succeed individually may be some of the worst things uh, that can happen to a team. And we're going to talk about the bad apples and the people who actually destroy morale. Um, notice also the interaction between a group and a team. We said many times in the G2 program that a group is a bunch of people. A group is a bunch of people in an elevator, perhaps. A team is a bunch of people in an elevator, but the elevator is broken. Why? Because they have a shared purpose. They have a shared goal. They're trying to overcome a challenge together. And morale almost by definition has to do with success. We said it's the desire to succeed and success has to do with a goal. It has to do with something that we've agreed that we're going to pursue together, which is half of the definition of culture. Remember, culture is the shared goals and values of an organization. So sharing those goals is the foundation to morale, having an understanding of what the goals of the organization, the goals of the team are, and perhaps having goals of the team and the organization that are not in conflict with the individual goals. If I'm trying to achieve something very different than what my team is trying to achieve, then it's going to be very difficult for me to be in sync with the culture of that team and also to contribute to team morale. So culture is something that's a little more broad, um, actually a lot more broad, um, versus morale is a moment in time. If, if we're talking about a person, culture is a little bit like the character of that person, it, the way they consistently behave, the values that they hold, versus morale is a little bit more like the mood of that person. It's the way they feel in a given point in time. So morale is defined in the context of time, and morale emerges again, takes center stage in times of change and perhaps even crisis. And really, crisis is nothing more than a dramatic change that perhaps threatens us. And when that threat emerges, the environment in which we exist changes, and that has a profound impact on morale, which brings us here in the middle of this crisis, or hopefully towards the end of this crisis, I shouldn't even say in the middle, but you know, keep fingers crossed, um, trying to maintain the morale of people who are currently bunkered in their home offices and trying to juggle Zoom calls while they're juggling kids and dogs and variety of chores, and at the same time, trying to take really good care of clients while very much facing a reality that compensation may not be what we were hoping it will be, profitability may not be there, bonuses may not be there, perhaps even other components of job satisfaction can be threatened. Now, team morale is influenced by many factors, and we'll try to create a full library of those, but probably we can group it together in four categories. It really has to do with leadership, uh, and we'll examine what kind of leadership is best in, in times of crisis. It has to do with team dynamics, that sense of camaraderie that people care about each other. The motivation, both the team motivation and the individual motivation of everyone participating, and of course, we can take that team out of the environmental context, the notion that it exists in a time of crisis and is trying to tackle a crisis. So we'll examine the components of that as well. Now, before we jump into those ingredients, though, I want to remind you of Abraham Maslow's research published in 1943, so long, long time ago. It's an old theory, but it's a theory that has a lot of validity. And Maslow has, basically says that we have a hierarchy of needs and we meet, we meet those needs in this order of priority. We start with the physiological needs, things like food, water, sleep, warm, shelter, and then we progress to our personal safety. And then we, having met those needs, we can pay attention to affection and, and sense of belonging, and then work on our self-esteem and look for things such as prestige and accomplishment and job titles, um, and even further go into self-actualization and advancement of our careers and so on. Notice that most of the time in a work context, in the context of a working organization, we kind of operate at the very top of the pyramid. We are talking about things such as 
career progressions, about career advancements. We're talking about things such as uh, positions and opportunities and chances to be a leader and so on. Those tend to be at the top of the pyramid. They work at the esteem and self-actualization level. Notice that in a time of crisis, however, we're going to hit the bottom of the pyramid. Time of, times of crisis may actually bring up issues of security, issues of safety. Do I still have a job? Can I still pay the bills? Um, is my work environment safe? Actually, suddenly that is a factor of our environment. Can I actually go to the office and feel safe? Do I have to wear a mask or what kind of protective environment um, gear I have to wear? And thankfully, most of us are in occupations where safety is not a big issue, but it became one. It certainly became one. And even in some of the organizations that we work with, it, there are some difficult questions, such as should someone still keep on going back to the office or do we maintain distance from each other? And especially as states are opening one after the other, there are going to be some difficult questions there as well. But I want you to remember that, that normally we operate at the top of the pyramid but some of the issues that we have to deal with uh, in maintaining team morale and addressing the, op the, the functioning of a team have to do with the bottom of the pyramid. We really have to talk about issues that go at a very, very basic level. And when we face challenges at a basic level, we also react at a very basic level. When we talk about things such as career progression and achievement and, and so on, we tend to operate from the frontal lobe. We tend to act in an intellectual and sophisticated way. But when we have needs such as safety and security and job security and our ability to exist, um, when those are threatened, we may be reacting at a very basic level, maybe using the fight and flight uh, type of reaction, which is not always the most constructive one. Now, morale matters a lot. Um, and I don't think I need to convince you of that because chances are in your work history, you can think of both teams that you really enjoy being part of and teams that you couldn't leave fast enough. And chances are you can remember many examples of working in a place where everybody was committed, where teamwork was seamless, where communication was very easy, where everyone seemed to be happy, when it wasn't difficult to make customers, clients happy, where everyone kind of seemed to be motivated and just enjoyed going to work. And that really are the characteristics of an organization that has good morale. But the opposite is probably true, that you can remember somewhere, hopefully in your distant past, um, Another type of organization where constantly someone is unhappy, where everything is difficult to do, where information doesn't flow as freely, uh, where most of the conversations focus on what went wrong, where everyone seems to be frustrated, where we don't trust each other, where we kind of keep looking at each other, wondering if the other person is paid more or better than I am, where you visibly see people who are walking around with low motivation. And those, unfortunately, are the characteristics of the low morale. And morale has a very pervasive effect. And I'll give you many, many examples of that. But it affects everything. It affects the financial performance of an organization. It affects client satisfaction. Um, it, it's very difficult to keep clients happy if you're personally not happy. Um, there's a wonderful book called Setting the Table. And in that book, the author basically makes this proposition. He, he writes about the industry. Danny Meyer is the author. It took me a moment to remember. Danny Meyer says that in the restaurant and industry, we're focused all the time in making the client happy. And we say that the customer is always right. But he says that's actually not true, that there's no way to make the customer happy if your team is not happy. So in setting the table, Danny Meyer proposes that you have to take good care of your team and then your team will take good care of the customers. So morale impacts financial performance. It impacts even the individual health. Uh, people who are happy at work tend to do better health-wise than people who are not. Uh, certainly, it has been studied from a financial perspective, and um, there are statistics that indicate that, that companies that have high level of employee engagement, and that's another way of describing high morale, have 50% higher return to shareholders. That companies that have engaged employees have less turnover, 87% less likely to leave the company. Very importantly, and I really like this one, in a place where employees are engaged, the cost, the cost of disengaged employees, those that don't care that much, those that don't contribute to the culture, they don't participate uh, as actively in what the organization is trying to achieve, they waste about as much as a third of their payroll. In other words, the cost of low morale is high. And particularly in times like this, the cost of low morale can be disastrous. Because by definition, a crisis will challenge us. We will challenge us at a very basic level and whatever wasn't working, and I'll tell you this from experience, in an organization with low morale, 
Morale will never get better because of a crisis. On the contrary, it will get even worse. So if you were experiencing low morale in the good times, um, it's becoming a critical level problem during times of crisis. And morale makes all the difference. I, I think you've heard me many, many times talk about history. I'm a little bit of a history buff. Um, and I particularly like to study and read about Asian history, Roman history, Greek history, and so on. Um, I kind of run into one of those examples just no long ago reading about the history of the Byz Byzantine Empire. The last time the Roman Empire assembled an army was the time they were trying to deal with the Vandals. And the Vandals were so bad, they actually... Can you hear me? Okay. Um, the, forgive me for that. I, I got I got a couple of I got one text message saying they've lost my audio. So I am uh, forgive me for for that interruption. Paranoid about the quality of, of of video and audio at this point. But anyway, so let's go back to the Vandals. So the Romans are trying to deal with the Vandals, and that was the last time they ever assembled the great army. Um, it was a big army, actually. It was fifty thousand men, a thousand ships. Um, and they went into battle, and the result was disastrous. At first contact with the enemy, the Roman emperor himself actually fled the battlefield, believing they're getting defeated, even though they outnumbered the battle, the, uh, they outnumbered the Vandals. As a result of that, his entire army led, fled. Uh, about half of them were slaughtered, and that was the last time ever the Roman Empire actually had a big army of that time. About 70 years later, on the almost the exact same spot, um, a general by the name of Belisarius, uh, one of the more brilliant and lesser known generals in history, Belisarius um, landed there with 15,000 men, less than a third of the army that the, the Roman emperor had. He was facing 100,000 Vandals, about six times more. And by the way, Vandals were not exactly the kind of barbarians that we, uh, that we, we perceived them to be. They were pretty sophisticated when it came to waging war. Belisarius was facing six times the size of army, his army went into battle, and of course, this time the Vandals fled because their leader, their king, actually fled in the middle of battle, believing they were being defeated. In other words, morale makes morale makes all the difference. Uh, it makes all the difference in war, but it makes all the difference in business as well. An organization that has the wrong leader in times of prosperity, in times of success, is going to be really challenged in times of crisis. And the characteristic of the types of leaders that are effective in maintaining morale really have to do most of all with people who act unselfishly. The best time of leader in terms of maintaining morale, and this comes from a book by David Balls called Employee Morale, um, very obvious title. He says that the best types of leaders in terms of maintaining morale are the kinds of leaders that can leave their ego at the door, that are not threatened by their teammates, people who are very good at acting as a coach as opposed to controlling others, and that act with respect, with fairness, and they focus on the mutually agreed upon goals. And of course, morale sometimes can act as something very abstract. Uh, it can sound like a, one of those kind of a big terms that it's not very easy to perceive what we can do about it. But there are some very obvious things that every leader can do in a situation much like this one. First of all, and the, the very obvious but very important one is to communicate. As leaders, we have to anticipate and perhaps confront the difficult questions. And we got to realize that in a time like this, as much as we don't want to admit it, some of our teammates may be wondering, do I still have a job? Is my compensation going to be affected by this? And hopefully for all of us, the answer is no, no, we're safe and things are good. But we got to realize that some team members may be wondering about that. Some team members may be concerned about that. We also have to speak honestly and we have to speak with a sense of integrity. Uh, it's easy to be hopeful, it's easy to forecast, it's easy to tell others what we hope is going to happen, but we also have to be very honest about what the reality is. Where do we stand financially? Where do we stand strategically in terms of our organizational health? Where do we exactly, what, what, what place in time and, and uh, where exactly are we? Um, a leader also has to stay positive and in a time of crisis that is difficult to do. Uh, chances are you already experiencing this or yourselves. Um, you wake up every morning, um, the days go by one after the other. You don't see a lot of people, you don't talk to a lot of people, but somehow you have to maintain a positive tone of conversation. You have to be able to maintain 
you believe um, in your conviction, stronger than that, the conviction that everything will be fine and everything will work well and actually we will successfully go through all of this. A team that doesn't have a leader who is positive is going to have a very hard time succeeding. A team that doesn't believe in itself is going to have a hard time succeeding. Dealing with a crisis also challenges us to be creative, to adapt, to change the organization, to change the way we do things in order to adapt and respond to the crisis. And very importantly, and we'll spend quite some time on that, we got to make sure that we remove the bad apples, that if there were any people in the organization who were toxic to begin with, now is the worst time to have them on board. So we really, really have to deal with that. To go to, back to Daniel Pink, and you've heard a lot about Daniel Pink in his book, Drive, he really talks about motivation being a, a, a function of three factors, of autonomy, of mastery, and a sense of purpose. And you can speak to each of these in terms of creating better team morale, that we need autonomy in terms of timely and honest feedback and in terms of empowering others to act. This is not a very good time to actually be looking over people's shoulder because that physically is impossible. We are not together. Um, our ability to observe each other is diminished. So empowerment is a better strategy. And we need a sense of support. We need a sense of camaraderie. We need a sense that we're all of this together but also don't forget about recognizing your teammates. Their contributions are just as valuable, if not more valuable than before. And recognition comes in many forms. Um, physically, some of the forms of recognition may no longer be there. Very often in most companies, there will be some kind of a weekly or even more frequent meeting where we can actually recognize those that are contributing the most. We can point at the people that are that are performing very well and that are contributing a lot to the organization during some kind of a staff meeting, some kind of a lunch and say, hey, Lauren, thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, that's not possible right now, at least not in a lunch meeting, but we shouldn't forget about that. We shouldn't forget recognizing those that contribute the most. And then very importantly, we have to continue emphasizing our shared goal. What are we trying to achieve together? And the tangible goals, the fact that we're helping people, the, time, the fact that we're helping families, those are the kinds of goals that will matter in a crisis more so than achieving the kind of more business oriented goals as maintaining certain level of assets or bringing certain number of clients in the firm. And I will probably propose that in formulating goals, every organization has to actually maintain high morale as one of its goals. Much like we say we need to bring X number of clients and X amount of assets into the firm, we perhaps should have a goal that speaks to the level of morale that we have as an organization. Now, morale is not so measurable. We can't say, oh, our morale on a scale of one to 100 is 75. But that said, we can observe the characteristics of good morale. And good morale leads, generally speaking, to good motivation individually. People operate better. They operate more effectively. And the opposite is true. Poor morale can actually destroy the performance of, of otherwise great performers, people that otherwise will be very productive. A lot has been written about what motivates people, and we've discussed actually in the G2 program many of these theories, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs to uh, Frederick Hertzberger's motivation hygiene theory to Daniel Pink's drive, and we'll quote many of those, but they all kind of point in the same direction. And I want to make this very clear that there's sometimes a tendency in management, uh, usually that's larger companies, not companies of our size or companies in our industry, but sometimes there's a tendency to try to word, to use the big words to create more satisfaction and more motivation. Uh, we talk a lot about empowerment, we talk a lot about culture, we talk about achievement, we talk about progression, but we gotta remember that none of these things are very possible without actually that what Hertzberger calls the hygiene factors. That people need to know that their job is secure, that their compensation is fair, their environment is safe and they exist in a place of fairness and sound policies. And when those needs are met, remember the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then we can actually create the motivating factors such as recognition, the work, the achievement, the responsibility, the advancement. Know that it's impossible to try to motivate a poorly paid workforce, but you will be swimming against the current. You will be facing very difficult needs. Why am I talking about that? Well, because when we address the team morale in a crisis, the number one job that we have to do as, as leaders, as, as owners of advisory firms very often, and many of your owners, is to make sure that we, we make it very clear to everyone where they stand on the hygiene factors, particularly job security and compensation 
are going to be a couple of the things that are first in mind to each and every employee. So we got to address those before we go down the route of the big words about, you know, achievement and responsibility and advancement and everything else. High morale in the research of Dr. David Sirota, and Sirota was a psychologist, uh, really has three ingredients. The first one is a sense of fairness, that we are in this together and we are in this equally. And this is going to be important because we may have to make some very unpopular changes to compensation. Bonuses are frequently in a time of crisis not available. Compensation may go down in 2008, 2009. There were companies that actually had to reduce salaries to employees. Um, some benefits may disappear. Hours may get a little longer. And if that happens, it's incredibly difficult to maintain a sense of fairness, that this really affects everyone, that this is not something that only happens to a group of people, particularly not to a lower ranking group of people at the expense of uh, perhaps owners or managers or high ranking employees maintaining their compensation or maintaining their sense of privilege. If that is the case, if fairness falls apart, the result is anger. And if you need an example of that, Look no further than the PPP program as the way it's been rolled out. Um, lawsuits are already going on that banks perhaps ordered the applications in the wrong order or in order of the size of the client relationship rather than the time of the arrival of those applications. There are many business owners who are angry that their application was either delayed or denied. Um, there are many that are accusing businesses of uh, not being eligible or perhaps should not be keeping the money. And that kind of a social discourse is gonna continue quite, for quite some time. It really is the sense of fairness. If once that's violated, morale sinks very quickly and very easily. Whatever we need to do within the organization, particularly if it has to do with money and compensation, and remember that speaks to the base of the pyramid, has to be fair. Morale also is a function of camaraderie, the sense of belonging and the sense of caring for each other. Um, camaraderie, very often managers treat camaraderie as something that kind of exists outside of them. It's the water cooler conversations, it's the happy hour type of stuff, and you can't really do it. Um, it either happens or doesn't happen amongst your employees. But the reality, at least in my experience, is quite the opposite, that you can encourage camaraderie. And the number one factor for camaraderie is the sense of belonging, the sense that every team member has that they're part of something, and that something not just accepts them, but also, also embraces them. Um, making sure that you don't forget any of your teammates, making sure that they all hear from you, but they also that they hear from each other is very, very important to the sense of camaraderie and the sense of caring. And if camaraderie exists, people come together to solve problem together, problems together. And if it doesn't exist, quite the opposite is true. People sometimes even sabotage each other. So it's fairness, it's camaraderie, and it's a sense of achievement. And achievement may have to be redefined in a time of crisis. Uh, achievement in, in normal times, in times of prosperity, is measured by our profits, by our growth, by our career progression, and so on. But some of these things may go away in a time of crisis. So it really is our challenge as leaders to redefine what achievement means. What have we achieved in a time when our revenues went down? Well, perhaps we maintain client relationships. Perhaps we help people that badly needed help. Perhaps we reach out to others that actually deserve um needed some help and deserve some assistance. Um, I've heard from at least a couple of organizations that we work with that they have started doing pro bono financial planning for people who otherwise would not be clients, but perhaps badly need financial planning and financial advice in a time like this. Redefining achievement and setting realistic goals that can be accomplished is going to make, be very instrumental in maintaining morale as well. And of course, morale is also a function of the team interactions, just the nature of, of team interaction and particularly the presence of toxic elements. Um, I've been reading quite a bit lately, uh, things written by Roy Baumeister and Baumeister published a paper some time ago called the bad is stronger than good. If you've heard of the five to one ratio, that's where it comes from. The five to one ratio is the notion that in any relationship, uh, you need five positive interactions to offset a negative one. So if you have a fight with your spouse, um, you need five positive experiences to overcome that, that fight. If you have a bad experience at the grocery store, you need five positive experiences to feel neutral about the grocery store again. Uh, bad experiences leave a really deep impact on us. They really shake us up. And the same is true for team interactions and team morale. 
Having a bad apple, as uh, Baumeister calls it, having a bad apple on the team is one of the most destructive elements of team morale. As a matter of fact, another researcher by the name of Will Phelps, Phelps created a, a, an inventory of bad apples. He literally created a catalog of the bad apples. And he talks about, first of all, the withholders of effort. The withholders of effort are the people that are not trying hard enough. They're only doing the minimum possible. They're always trying to... Um, to avoid responsibility and avoid work and maybe get somebody else to do it. And by doing so, they violate the sense of fairness. You start very, very easily start feeling like you're being taken advantage of as opposed to having supportive teammates. Um, the second category of bad apples is the effectively negative. And that becomes particularly true in a time like this. The effectively negative people are the people who are always complaining. They're always pessimistic and they're always gloom and doom and everything is a problem and everything is screwed up and everything is not working the right way. And people like that just affect the tone of conversation. And then the last and perhaps the worst category of teammates to have is what Will Phelps calls the interpersonal deviants. And the deviants, these are the people who just behave inappropriately or behave rudely or just ignore and violate social convention. These are the people who are bullies. These are people that say the wrong things. These are the people that approach their teammates with lack of respect and poor communication. Um, and obviously, all of those bad apples are the kinds of things that you don't want to have in your team. Now, if you tolerated any of this, if you saw any of this and maybe you looked the other way because they have a valuable role to play or they have potential or you feel bad about them, um, now is not a good time for that. As a matter of fact, Rob Bymeister talks about protecting yourself from the bad apples. Of course, being careful who you label a bad apple because once you do that, um, then you, it's very difficult to recover from that term. term. But also Baumeister says that don't hesitate to fire a jerk, but don't be a jerk about it. And I love that phrase as well. Uh, unfortunately, these are times when sometimes you have to fire people. And if you're going to fire anyone, then I would definitely start with the bad apples. Patrick Lencioni, and if you've read Lencioni's books, and if you haven't, you should. Um, his probably most famous book is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. He says that the worst things to happen on a team are, first of all, the absence of trust. Second of all, the fear of conflict, not dealing with conflict the lack of commitment, the avoidance of accountability, and the inattention to results. And each of those is a destructor to team morale, beginning with trust. And we've spent a lot of time on trust. Um, remember, we talked about trust being a bank account. You make deposits, we make withdrawals. The withdrawals are probably coming our way. Withdrawals are things such as difficult changes to their workplace, asking people to work under difficult conditions asking people to work more, telling everyone that perhaps they have to, um, uh, perhaps they shouldn't be expecting bonuses this year. But the deposits we make are in the form of maintaining fairness uh, and building goodwill and taking an interest in our teammates and taking interest in their development. There's a tendency for managers to believe that trust exists when it doesn't. Um, this is an interesting study done by the American Psychological Association and they were asking both supervisors and frontline workers about the elements of fairness and treatment in their, in their workplace. And there was a tendency for, in every single category, for senior leaders to actually overestimate the degree to which they're, they're treating people fairly in the office. Um, things such as decision-making procedures being fair, senior leaders believe they're more fair than they actually are, that rewards and recognition are distributed fairly, that the, the nature of the workplace and the nature of work meets the, the expectations of workers. All of those are components of what senior leaders believe exists, but actually, if you notice on that graph, less than half of the frontline workers believe, that, believe in that. And now, some level of conflict and friction exists in every workplace, and dealing with it is critical for the health of team morale. And we talked during the G2 program about the importance of sparring, sparring being the notion that you can experience conflict without actually hurting each other. That there is a way to approach a difficult problem where we disagree without actually trying to injure each other and destroy the relationship. That we can examine that as a debate rather than a conflict and we can resolve it that way. It's also the same sense of commitment. And I see that from time to time I work with study groups and I see this with study groups very clearly. 
if people come prepared and do all the pre-work before the first study group meeting, the second study group meeting is always a very productive one. Everybody comes to the study group meeting again prepared and having done the pre-work. However, the opposite is true. If you show up for the first study group meeting um, and you find that nobody else has prepared, nobody else has done their homework, you may be very reluctant to actually do the homework for the second meeting. My wife tells me that the same is true for book clubs. If you show up for a book club meeting and no one has read the book, chances of you reading the next book are actually very low. A sense of accountability is also very important that if we make decisions that everyone is gonna to stick to those decisions and actually do their part. And then of course we have to be results oriented. Effort is not enough. Um, we are in business which by definition means that we have to get certain things done. And it doesn't matter how much we tried and how many meetings we had, if the result is not there, if we lost the client relationship or we didn't complete the project, um, that that can be very detrimental, not just to the team morale, but the functioning of the, the team. Now we said the fourth component of morale is gonna be the context, the environment. And unfortunately, a crisis is gonna take a toll on everyone. And it, that toll is gonna be an emotional toll. Uh, we will deal with a lot of uncertainty, you are all dealing with difficult conversations with clients. We're feeling sort of the burden of sympathy when you talk to people who are experiencing something bad, that burdens you as well. Unfortunately, we're surrounded by losses, losses of jobs, businesses that are struggling. Uh, we may even as leaders be wondering if that, that loss and all of, these, um, all of these negative changes will actually impact some of us as well. And it does also impact the performance. We have to work longer. We have to work remotely. We have to wonder, can you still hear me? Can you still see me? Is WebEx still working? Is Zoom going to be working? All of that takes a toll on us. Fortunately, though, and we've mentioned this before, research indicates that actually in times of crisis, we experience something called crisis bonding. And that's true within our team. That's also true for our clients as well. When they did an experiment, and they did it with male participants, particularly because male participants were the most suspect for engaging in fight or flight. They were most suspect in engaging in aggression, that if they're stressed out, they're gonna be more aggressive and less collaborative. So they very very specifically targeted male participants. They, they, with, they split them in two groups. And with the first group, they stressed them out before they played what they call an economic game. An economics game is basically, Think of a game of Monopoly, for example, is an economics game. There are winners and losers and there's money involved and um, it's a game, but it kind of feels like real life in the sense that, you know, some people are more successful than others. So they stressed them out first and they had them playing the game. And when they stressed them out first and they had them playing the game second, what they found was actually that those that experienced crisis together tended to collaborate. They experienced the stress not separately, they experienced it together. And in doing so, they tended to collaborate and actually be more effective in playing the game versus the control group that didn't have that crisis experience together. And the same is true probably in your own personal experience. People uh, who have played sports frequently recognize that. If you've been in difficult games together, you tend to bond. Um, I think soldiers experience that for the rest of their lives. Uh, we all remember who was around us in 2008, 2009. Um, we've been all part of organizations that have gone through some very difficult changes, for example, layoffs. I still remember, you know, who my friends were at the time. Uh, that kind of crisis bonding is a very powerful connection that's engaged right now. Everyone remembers who's on the Zoom call. Everyone remembers who did they talk to. All these virtual happy hours are actually working very, very well. Something else is true as well, and they studied that. The researcher by the name of Barbara Fredrickson uh, wrote a paper on that, that after September 11, the, 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 the traumatic experience of September 11 actually caused people to form stronger personal relationships. Uh, friendships became stronger, um, connections with the community became stronger, connections within the family became stronger, and chances are, to the degree that you play an important role in the life of your clients, and to the degree that you play an important role in each other's lives as teammates, uh, those connections are getting stronger as well. And crisis also builds resilience. It builds an intellectual resilience. It allows us to have more complexity and more nuances in our thinking, but it also gives us a more sense of creativity and optimism that we can deal with a crisis, that we can actually overcome it, that we, we are better than that. 
Unfortunately, all of these elements of crisis bonding are particular to what's known as acute stress. In other words, something that happens over a relatively short period of time. Unfortunately, all of us, when we're exposed to chronic stress, in other words, this goes on and on and on and on, as opposed to being more collaborative, we turn actually less collaborative. We have more problems with each other. We start getting a little more aggressive. We start being a little more irritable. So it's important to remember that, that this discontinuous, as leaders, we have to communicate even more. We have to spend more time and more energy being positive, and we have to put even more effort into bringing people together and really focusing on team morale. There's so much to do. Unfortunately, we may find that this is not the best year for compensation, which means that we have to emphasize every other type of recognition and every other type of award and reward that we can provide. That this may be a year even where career progression becomes difficult. Uh, promotions in some organizations may not be available. There are promotion and hiring freezes in some of the larger organizations that are popping up already. We may find that work and life balance take an entirely different meeting, which means that we have to be even more sympathetic, more empathetic. We have to be even more flexible as leaders, allowing people to actually restore that balance. Stress may be higher, and because of the higher stress, we all may exhibit behavior that is not as good as we normally would be, and we have to be more flexible with that, but we also have to make sure that we don't allow for bad apples to become even worse. And unfortunately, job security is going to come under threat, and I think it's critical for each and every organization to come to that conclusion of, is this necessary, is this likely, and very openly communicate what is the reality of that business. And finally, I do want to offer some thoughts also on virtual work because that's kind of a very unusual type of, um, it's very unusual time in the sense that we actually can get together. We can actually speak physically to each other. So I, I took some interest in what is known about virtual teams and how virtual teams handle morale and how they behave in a time of crisis. Uh, there's a good book called uh, Group Dynamics of Teams. It's a textbook we used in sociology uh, and psychology classes. And it speaks to the fact that virtual teams are actually very good performers in some areas, particularly virtual teams are best for generating ideas, uh, creating workplace flexibility, brainstorming. In other words, there's a lot of creativity behind this way of working, working remotely from each other. Unfortunately, and we got to remember that because it does impact team morale. Um, the weaknesses of virtual teams have to do with negotiation, have to do with consensus building, have to do with the exchange of information. And very importantly, they score much lower in the sense of belonging category, which again, very directly speaks to morale. To overcome that, we need to be aware of the limitations of the virtual type of work. There's just less context. Uh, we don't see each other. There's limited body language. Um, we may not be perceiving everything that's happening around that person. All of us are inclined to maybe look at an email while we are talking on the phone or talking on the Zoom call. Um, the norms of communication may be unclear. Should I be wearing a shirt? Is it okay to wear a T-shirt in that environment? Uh, all of those weaknesses are pretty preeminent, pretty important, and we have to recognize them. We have to understand them as leaders. The good news, though, is that teams that are well-established, teams that know each other, trust each other, perform much better in a virtual environment. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. Teams that are relatively new and teams that haven't spent a lot of time together may be more challenged in a virtual environment, which to me, that means that if you have a new teammate, someone who started in your organization just a week ago or a month ago, you got to take extra time to actually communicate with them and give them time and attention so they have that sense of belonging and they receive the necessary information. Um, vice versa, if you have people who have been working together for a long, long time, perhaps they can take the lead. Perhaps they can be empowered to do even more because in this type of environment, you're going to have less of an opportunity to look over their shoulder and supervise everything they do. Something else that happens in virtual work as well, it's, it's easier for that to break down into cliques and subgroups and sort of subcultures. So you have to protect against that and make sure as a leader that you reach out to each and every person, that you give them some individual time, some of your attention, and really just make sure that they feel like part of the team, even though they physically can be part of the same meeting, the same office, and the same connection. So to summarize uh, quickly, um, 
Morale is critical for our success as an organization. We can't do everything that we aspire to do in a difficult time like this without actually coming together, without caring about each other and being committed and invested in the success that we have as a team. And morale really has four ingredients. It has to do with the context in which we exist, and that context has changed, and it has changed for the worst. But it also has to do with leadership, it has to do with motivation, and it has to do with the way in which we interact with each other and the way we relate to each other. And morale is an outcome, but morale also should be a strategy. It should be something that we focus on, something that we set as a goal. In an environment where perhaps profits and growth and new assets are not the best of goals to pursue, it may be difficult to pursue, um, perhaps morale can be our goal. And perhaps it could be something that we target knowing that we interact well together and that we stay together. So. I think I, 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 I spoke about this before, that coming together is the beginning, staying together is the success. Um, we have been successful before. We have overcome challenges like that before. So look forward to overcoming this together. I hope you feel that you're part of a community, that you're part of something that's part of G2. I look forward always to your questions, look forward to your any interactions with you. And, Please come to the happy hours, regardless of, uh, of happy hours. I'm dreaming of happy hours. The office hours, uh, regardless of whether you're part of a, a current class or not. But most importantly, remember that you have each other. There's over 200 of you that have been part of this program. There's a lot of ideas that there's a lot that you can help each other with.